Welcome to Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan, the program on Jordan Owen 42, where we look at various writers, various novels, and talk about the art and the craft of writing and what these people have meant to the written word as a whole. So my co-host in this, as always, is Stefan DiOrio. How are you doing, Stefan? Just fine. Thanks, Jordan. So for this installment, we are discussing The Sound of Waves by Yukio Mishima. Yukio Mishima was in life considered to be Japan's greatest living novelist, and his legend still looms large, uh, both for the impact of his writing and for his controversial and flamboyant personal life. Yukio Mishima's writing is frequently dark and very, deals with themes of self-destruction, of adolescent rage, and uh, repressed desire. The Sound of Waves carries with it a lot of those themes, but it's much, much more lighthearted and resolves on a much lighter note. And I'll emphasize here that we will do everything in our power to avoid spoilers, uh, but some may still seep through. Regardless, we encourage you to read this book and all of the books that we talk about here on Book Talk, uh, because certainly there is much, much more to be learned and be gained from them than simply the... um, than simply the the stories, the plot lines themselves. So, The Sound of Waves tells the story of Shinji, a humble fisherman who falls in love with Hatsue, the daughter of the wealthiest man on his uh, in his tiny fishing community, which takes place. The book takes place. Uh, almost entirely on Yutajima, Song Island in Japan. And it's a very picturesque novel about gossip, about uh, the aristocracy, about uh, social mores and social traditions in Japan. And I personally have always seen her, have always seen uh, Yukio Mishima as being like the Japanese answer to F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I think anyone who has read The Great Gatsby and then turns around and would then turn around and read a uh, Yukio Mishima novel would know uh, almost immediately what I'm talking about. So, Stefan, what are you? What were your impressions of this novel overall? Well, because it's a, a short story novella, there's not a lot of time to develop a character or to have a, a, a big, engrossing series of characters that can interact with the protagonist, and you're really trying to identify who this character is, who is Shinji, what he's trying to do. And it's rather difficult because you can't really grasp this setting. You can't really grasp what he's going through. We've never been to these, this, I don't even know if it's a real island in Japan, but it's, it feels like this, this salt of the earth or salt of the ocean fisherman. And as soon as you read this, you're like, where is this taking place? How is this person dealing with these villagers in his life? So immediately you're sort of, awestruck by who this person is, even though it's the simplest character, the simplest fellow. The other characters in the story are also very, uh, I wouldn't say one-dimensional, but they're they're just sort of stereotypes. And you see, okay, this is the rich guy, this is the poor guy, this is the fisherman. But once you get into the novel, once you get into a few chapters, you realize, okay, I know what the author's doing. He wants to tell a story of an idealized Japanese countryside, which happens to take place on an island. And once you grasp that, once you understand what that's about, then you can actually enjoy that this is a more of a coming-of-age story that happens to involve a romance. And you don't see uh, one of the characters like Yasuo or uh, I think the lighthouse owner or whomever the, the father, the richest father, uh, the richest owner in the villages, you don't see them as antagonists, you see them as people. And this, this could easily be a uh, someone telling a story of their trip to an, uh, an archipelago in, in Japan for a month or two. And it, it actually feels like a documentary of some sort in that sense, even though it's told in the villa style. I agree. And I will, uh, to, to answer one thing you said, Utajima actually is a real island in Japan. And um, if you uh, Google search, or in my case, Bing search, the uh, Utajima, you can actually see the lighthouse that they're referring to in the novel. And I think you're right. I think that what happens in this novel, these characters, and this is part of why uh, I, I think of Mishima as being the Japanese uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, because F. Scott Fitzgerald was a, a writer who was very keenly aware of symbolism. 
And it struck me that all of the characters in this novel, like you say, they're stereotypes in a way that you have the wealthiest man on the island, you have the humble fisherman, you have the, um, you know, you have the, the, the kind of dainty, proper young lady that's caught up in the middle of it and everything. And what, what, what they spoke to me as were symbols. These, are, these people are symbolic of specific values that Mishima wants to discuss and he wants to talk about. And these were values that were very near and dear to his heart. He was somebody who uh, wrote, who was, you know, very passionately in support of the Japanese aristocracy, of the emperor, of the um, the Japanese nobility and all of that. It's kind of ironic because so much of his writing uh, deals with the aggravations and the limitations imposed on society by the aristocracy. And another of his novels, uh, Spring Snow, deals with a, uh, which uh, stands out as one of my favorite books by him, uh, deals with a similar case of young love that is being uh, trod upon and interfered with by the plans and the machinations of aristocratic families. Uh, the difference there is that both the, the, the young man and the young girl both come from aristocratic noble families, whereas in the sound of waves, only one of them does. But I think you're right. I think you're on point that this is a novel that is a coming of age novel, and it is very much Shinji is when you talk about who Shinji is and what he is, this is somebody who is, I think, and we see this towards the end of the novel, somebody who is learning how to seize his own destiny and how to embody how ra- how to rather than try how to try to please people and gain people's approval uh how to gain their respect and their admiration and that when he truly does that he truly realizes himself as a character we have actually a happy ending which is uh very unorthodox for um for Yukio Mishima uh spring snow ends very tragically uh, very in a very dark, uh, sad atmosphere. Uh, Stefan, you and I had previously, um, I know I had turned you on to Yukio Mishima, and you read uh, Confessions of a Mask, which, as you'll recall, strangely doesn't really have an ending. It just sort of stops. You might, uh, you one might, had Mishima not finished it and handed it into the publisher, one might conclude that it was an unfinished novel. Uh, so. Uh, I think so. I think that that um, that this is very unorthodox for Mishima, who tends to have a lot of very ambiguous writing. This was actually a very happy story, uh, in a lot of ways, and uh, and it deals with in, in a lot of ways. You're right that it's like a travel log. It's like a travel guide taking you to this island, and um, they did. He did a very good job of making the island seem like a very friendly. Uh, even though the characters are frequently not friendly, but the island itself a very inviting, friendly sort of place. And I think of. Um, I was thinking one of the very powerful symbols in my mind was how, uh, if you think about the way the island is described, the two major landmarks that are on equal footing with each other are the. Um, they they are the shrine the shin uh, the uh, uh, Shinto shrine that every uh, that everybody pays respects to and the um, and uh, did I say Shinto is was it a Buddhist shrine do you recall I don't recall the I think it was Shintoism because he actually had to give money and it was a big collection box and the funny the funny thing about that scene is that's that's the scene that cued me in to what was going on in the story because he he sits down he prays he prays for three things he prays for to do well as a fisherman. Uh, to protect his family, his his brother and his and his mom, and so that he can find love with uh, Hatsu. And as soon as I, I saw that, the, the sentence after was like, you know what? Maybe I prayed for too much. I think the gods are going to punish me because I'm being too selfish. And as soon as I clued in on that, aha! This is what Mishima wants to tell us. He wants to get the the most idealized Japanese farmer or fisherman and make him humble make him strong, make him honest, and that's it. And that's what he's going to be throughout the entire story. Uh, it's, it, that's, that's the core of what uh, Shinji is. And you sort of have to laugh at that because it's like, what, is he, what does he mean? He's, the gods are going to punish him because he wants to do well in life and, and to love someone? It's like, this is, this is nothing special. But to him in his mind, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm being so selfish here on this island with the most beautiful woman here. And, you know, 
it's it's kind of charming how they have these scenes that I can't relate to because you can't imagine the culture of these people and their lifestyle where you have these women who are pretty much uh, divers. They dive for, I think it was abalone at the, the bottom of, of their, not the, the ocean, but the shawls of the, of the ocean. And there's like a contest and there's this peddler coming by. And these women are all like, oh, the peddler's here, we're naked. And they're all just joking around. They're totally, it's like a, reading about ancient Greece. Everyone's like naked in wrestling. In this case, they're all just being extremely honest and open, being modest about uh, around this old peddler selling them stuff. So that is very unique to me to see these kinds of scenes and what happens in these scenes that uh, showcase, again, the, the family that Shinji comes from, the, the strong, salt of the ocean type of people, and that is throughout the entire story. So you have to realize, okay, there's probably not going to be a major antagonist, there's probably not going to be uh, a major dramatic, like we think of dramatic structure, that's, that's probably not going to happen. Um, and that's fine. You can do that in a short story. You can get away with it if you know what you're doing. And because it's set up this way, because we can clue in on all the scenes that are happening, and, uh, you know, aside from Shinji, there's another even bigger man who's who's feared by everyone, and he's he's kind of like the boss. And you know, it, that's that's the sort of uh, mentality you get to, to understand what Mishima's trying to tell you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that, and I think you hit on it right there, that what, what Shinji is realizing, the gods punishing him for wanting too much, that's his own way of realizing that he's going to have to become worthy of these things, you know, and that his evolution, he grows up, he becomes an adult uh, by becoming worthy of these things that he wants, which you're right, are very simple things, but at the same time... Yeah, you're, you're making a point there because he's saying... It's about him. Like he has to make the choice. So the 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 challenge isn't so much uh, the ordeal later in the story or another love interest. It's just him. He has to step up and become the man he's trying to become. And that's what you get all throughout the story. You're like, okay, he he might have a, a love rival. Oh, he might die. Oh, this might happen. This might happen. It's like, no. Can I do this? I'm gonna try. And he goes out and does it. Uh, there's all these scenarios. You think maybe the the, the, the richest man in town is. Is his enemy? No. Maybe it's his mom? No. It's always an internal conflict, which is very subtle because he's a fisherman. He's not th that complex a character. He's not uh, he's some diabolical mastermind trying to win the hearts of a woman. He's just being honest and truthful. And there's another love, love rival comes by to him and he's like, hey, you look great. And she's like totally distraught. And all of a sudden with that one word, she's just, you know, incredibly happy. It changes her whole world. And I think that's really what this this story is about is just being honest being a man being japanese and when you when you understand that i think this was this story was written after world war ii but to me it could have been written 50 years ago for, from then it could have been written 10 years ago from now uh it's that sort of frame that it can exist throughout the entire 20th century that uh, you look back and say yep that's that's japanese that is a japanese man living in uh i don't know the okinawa prefecture being a fisherman that's that well you know it's interesting to me because um i i had in a way kind of an opposite reaction where i thought that mishima you know you have to remember in mishima's in his own life he craved uh approval from the western literary establishment and um they used to talk they used to joke about how when he was speaking to uh western literary audiences he dressed in like a suit and tie very conservatively because he was just you know just manically wanting a, the approval of the uh the crowd that had embraced thomas mann and the writers like these and so what I got, you know, and this is something that it, it felt, it actually, the story and these values felt very familiar to me because I grew up, I've lived in the South most of my life, the, the American South, the, the U.S. South most of my life. And uh, these are values that are very, very, you know, very prevalent here in a way that, I mean, very obviously they're, they are modified to suit the modern world, but uh there is a prevailing sense of like that pre-Civil War antebellum aristocracy around or in, in the South and that kind of traditional, uh, traditional hierarchical mode of life. 
And so, in a way, I was very much able to think of these as trans as a this is a transcendent story. And that's what was interesting to me was it didn't strike me as a Jap- particularly Japanese story. I felt like this was a story that could happen on the you know it's a fishing village, so you could put this on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and it would happen down there as well. You know, and in, in, indeed down there they have these small. Uh, rural communities where you've got maybe, uh, you know, a couple thousand people total in the entire community, like what's described here in, in this book. And, um, and that, uh, you know, so to, so to me, this was very transcendent. It was uh, it, where, and, and you're right, though, that a lot of, a lot of Mishima's writing is very, very harshly Japanese. Uh, you know, we were talking about Confessions of a Mask, and that deals very much with uh, Japanese culture, and especially the culture and the atmosphere in Japan around the time of World War II, which, for listeners who don't know, Confessions of a Mask is a, uh, it's a semi-autobiographical novel uh, that Mishima wrote about the experience of growing up gay in World War II era Japan, which, as you can imagine, you have not only Japanese society, which doesn't have really a lot of room for that, but also, unless you're going to go to the samurai ethos, which is what Mishima embraced, but at the same time, Japan was one of the, I mean, Japan was one of the Axis powers. They were, uh, at the time, we're talking about a very hardline, fascistic environment, and so you have this very prevailing negative sense of Japanese culture in that novel uh, and the struggle to deal with conformity and, and society's expectations and that sort of thing. And so to me, I, that, that was interesting to me, though, that the, this seemed very, trans, uh, very transcendent. And what I was saying earlier, uh, talking about the symbols of the shrine being a strong symbol, and then what was the other thing the other landmark on, in the story that was put in, as being like parallel to the shrine, which was the lighthouse. And I thought it was so interesting. You know, the lighthouse is where we see, where the, that's where all the gossip comes from and all the rumors come from because they can see everything. They can see everything that's going on all over the island. And so how did that strike you? How did, what did the lighthouse say to you? Uh, it it kind of felt like a, a part of a children's book, like Rapunzel, as soon as the the man descends from the lighthouse or the, or the mayor or whatever the richest guy was. I keep forgetting his name. And he goes to the bathhouse. He discovers what's going to happen uh, or the gossip that's happening. And he comes back. He rapunzels his daughter. And he's like, no way. We're not going to have any discussion or talk about uh, this man you may or may not fall in love with. And that's at least the attitude we think is going on. But we don't really know because he stops talking to everyone. So it's this kind of... this. Uh, uh, a place originally where Shinji goes to kind of pay alms for thanking uh, the, the the man of getting him graduated from school because he's not an intellectual. He just wanted to become a fisherman all his life. So thank you very much for getting me out of school. Here's a fish. I'm going to keep doing this. And everyone sees Shinji do this. And, and the, the lighthouse owner and the lighthouse wife is all, oh, this guy's a wonderful person. He's giving us fish. Uh, while, while he's there, he'll talk to Hatsu. And that's how this all starts. So it's, it's this place where he goes to to discover who he wants to be and who he, who he loves and what he wants to do. And then it becomes this place where, oh my God, you can never go here anymore. It's sort of this, this alienated place. And when you were talking about uh, Confessions of a Mask, yeah, you were talking about conformity within semi-modern Japan at the time. And this is very isolated. This is completely within their own little world. And there's only maybe one or two scenes where they're outside of that, that island. So for that part of the, of the world, especially during the storm scene, where they're even more isolated and even more personal, it feels very claustrophobic. You feel like this is, this is all this guy is, and there's really nothing outside of, of his aspirations or his ambitions. So that lighthouse, again, was just like the shrine. This, well, I say more than the shrine, was a scene where, or an object that uh, enables... Uh, Shinji to discover that, oh, this is what I'm doing. This is my routine. I got to change myself now in order to adapt to whatever's happening. So I would, I wouldn't call it conflict. I would call it like, I don't, I'm not thinking in terms of a story. I'm thinking in terms of a young man who's delivering fish. Okay. He can't do that anymore. Now what does he have to do? He has to figure that out. So he just stoically waits and he just lets life pass by. (laughs) There's there's not a major, um, well, there is one attempt, but there's not like a a dramatic Romeo and Juliet scene. There's no, there's no major, uh, you know, fist fighting. There's nothing like that. It's all very laid back, uh, 
we're all going to chill and wait, wait for the, the, the head honcho to come down his mountain, and then we'll talk. And that's pretty much what happened. Yeah, you know, and that that was very, um, I, was, I was very keenly aware of that as well. And there's a, throughout, um, uh, there, there's a, a European filmmaker named Eric Rahm, who um, a friend turned me on to uh, a couple of years ago. And his, his films have that same kind of tone to them, that there's this placidity to them, you know, that these people, there's kind of a conflict, a general sense of a conflict happening, but it's not resolved directly. It's resolved by these people who uh, just kind of, they, they just kind of learn to interact with one another and the conflict sort of resolves itself externally. And I think it takes a great deal of skill on the part of either a filmmaker or a writer to tell a story that way, to carry it that way. You know, the lighter, uh, a more a more in- immediately relatable version might be uh, Kevin Smith. If you think about the early Kevin Smith movies like Clerks and Mallrats and that kind of thing, there's almost a parallel there where it's like there's this general, there, there's a, a conflict, but the conflict is really just kind of like a, a thesis topic for these characters to base their, their interactions off of. And what we have are these wonderful interactions, these wonderful conversations, and these wonderful uh, kind of insightful moments and these uh, odd sort of events. Uh, that was what I, that was definitely a feeling I got from the book. And that was, that to me, uh, and see how you, what you think of this, but to me, that was very much like uh, a kind of a universal theme that we see in a lot of Mishima's stuff, which Mishima was someone who was very attuned to. Uh, that kind of traditional Japanese art that we see in uh, traditional Japanese uh, landscape paintings and in um, uh, haiku and that sort of thing. That this observa- this sort of observational look at the natural world and everything, and uh, and and that and I think I think that more than anything is the pervasive theme of this book and of the uh, that it's it's it seems like a very mild sort of occurrence what happens in the story but there's a lot of very profound things happening under the surface what do you think about that well the the classical theme if we were to say a man versus environment is pretty clear uh it's versus the elements the ocean the the, the situations they, they place themselves in um so it's i mean I, again there's not much in the sense of of drama it never res, it never goes down to the point of melodrama where you say okay this is basically a soap opera because it's just a bunch of human relationships. Um, they're not fighting wars. They're not trying to kill each other. Uh, they're just trying to one-up each other on a small little island. And who's going to marry the, the, the prettiest girl? How do we get a point to that? And then they, they go other, or rather uh, the scenes play out, whereas the the main love rival has a, com- I wouldn't even call him a rival. He's more of a comic relief. Uh, the scenes that he goes through trying to, to I don't know, badger, the, I, I wouldn't call it, attempted rape it was just sort of this bizarre scenario where you're sitting there like this can't be taken seriously and it keeps happening over and over within like a span of 10 pages you're like okay this is clearly not dramatic this is just a, a, a joke and, th- and then you realize that Hatsu is actually very physical she's very healthy she's like she's she out swims or out uh, athleticizes uh, Shinji's mom and she's like the best diver there is so it's like okay fine we, we understand what's going on but it, it sort of just Downplays like that's when I, I thought okay if this is not going to be the gut wrenching murder uh, you know oh my god what are you doing to me Mishima scene it's going to happen later <laughs> and that never happened so you're like oh okay it was just a joke and then it's like oh this is just being heroic and oh okay wow that's a different story so yeah it, it really felt like uh, uh, well after the fact it felt like a soap opera without the melodrama which is very refreshing and especially the setting because it was so unique to me. I could say, oh, well, I could not, like you said, how it could be in Mississippi or, or other parts of, the, of, of uh, the world. I thought this was very Japanese. I thought the stoicism was, was its own flavor. It wasn't British stoicism, it wasn't Roman stoicism. It was very specific. And uh, it, fe- it felt to me like this, this is what, as I said before, what uh, the idealized uh, fisherman uh, lifestyle would be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I, that that I do uh, I do agree with. I, I do think there are some some specifically Japanese overtones that you know would be, it's kind of like um, there uh, another 
another uh, of Mishima's famous works is The Fisherman Who Fell from Grace with the Sea, and that was adapted to be a uh, that was adapted into a westernized film adaptation with Chris Christopherson as the uh, titular character, and there are definitely some uniquely Japanese cultural elements that are absent in that film that are, are glaringly absent. Um, and uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from there. I think I guess I should say the fundamentals of the story could happen anywhere, but there are overtones of purely Japanese culture. And that was that was one th- scene one, one interesting scene which was this attempted rape scene of uh, Hatsue. and I expected that you were I was right. I was uh, I was thinking, you know, more politically correct-minded people might even view the way that scene was handled in very poor taste because it's almost regarded as just a people just roll their eyes and go on with it. And uh, and and I was surprised by that. I thought that was going to be the point where we were going to see some very real, very significant drama. But I really what I I took away from that was just a you know uh and this is this is yeah Hatsue obviously is a young woman who's very able to take care of herself and she uh, fights that guy off without any uh without any difficulty and he ends up just looking like a boob but um that was what what I took away from that the symbolism that I took away from that was that you know your worthiness, you know, if we're, we're talking about what, what are the gods going to bestow upon you, what good fortune will they bestow upon you, you cannot go demand that good fortune be bestowed upon you, that it has to be, the good fortune has to be the result of your diligent commitment to your own virtuous nature. You can't just go out and seize it. And that was kind of what I thought was being said by that, because it's kind of like, you know, and you, you have various moments. Another moment like that is when uh, sh- uh, is when Shinji's mother attempts to go reason with Hatsue's parents, and the, and they won't even speak to her. They won't have anything to do with her. It's kind of like saying, you know, it's kind of like the message there is: look, you will not, uh, you cannot force this issue. This is to be purely resolved by the merit of your virtue, not by the causal result of your actions. And in a lot of ways, that is a very Japanese concept because it does deal with, uh, you know, in in Western writing, I think we see a lot more of a, a an attitude of like, you know, you you go out and seize the day, you win the day, you know, and that kind of thing. And this this is very much more about like, uh, it's kind of like a constant reminder to focus in on developing yourself and making yourself a better person and it's sort of and and in that way I think it is a very traditional Japanese affirmation and I say this as somebody who obviously is you know completely outside Japanese culture um so uh so I could I could just be seeing things that are just culturally alien to me and assuming they're Japanese but um on the whole I was uh I was very, um, I, 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 I was very impressed by that, and I think, and it, it really forces you to look at a narrative in a different, a different way, uh, and and evaluate the process of events in a different way. Right. I mean, the 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 literally spoken. I don't like this moments where uh, the author literally says, "Okay, this is the theme," and I, I get the. The, the feeling that's exactly what happened with the the ending with the uh, uh, Hatsu's father. I'm not going to say what it is, but uh, I thought that, that that was, even though it made sense, even though what he said was like, yep, this sort of attitude that people should have is right. It sort of, it spells it out. It's like, yep, this is exactly what I'm trying to tell you. This is what uh, this kind of mentality is for uh, young or even old people living on this sort of island. So I don't, I don't mind that sort of hand-holding. Um, it wasn't necessary, but it, it sort of made sense because this dude has been quiet the entire story, and he's the biggest guy on, this, on the island. Everyone looks up to him. He's in charge. It's just, obviously, it's the, uh, the guy who would allow Shinji to marry uh, his daughter. And for him to see this finally and to say these things, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we, yeah, we get that. Like, we, we knew something like that was going to happen. We didn't know what, but we knew, we knew the theme already. So for him to spell it out, um, I thought was okay because you generally do, never do that. You never say, "Oh, by the way, <laughs> this is what this story is about." So uh, I think that sort of feeling uh, may be too conservative Japanese, and Mishima is just saying it out loud, saying, "Okay, by the way, this is this is really 
what you need to do to be this kind of character or this kind of person in life. Um, that was kind of charming because again, if you have a, a wise man who says nothing and he says like two words, like "oh, I must listen to him," and that's sort of the, the impact I got. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, I I wonder as you say that, I wonder how much of that wraps up or how much of that comes down to the translation. Um, because, uh, you know, you think about a lot of things have to be stated directly, um, in translation from Jan. I know this because, you know, know, another of my favorite authors is Haruki Murakami, who, um, I I consider to be even, uh, even surpassing Mishima and surpassing most, most novelists living, living or dead as a, a phenomenal writer. But, um, I am, uh, you know, as, as I, I think about that, you know, so much of, because there's so much in Japanese, the Japanese language that does not translate literally into uh, the Romanized uh, languages or the Latin-based languages. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, even when you meet somebody in Japan, it's common to say, um, you know, hajimemashite dozo yorushiku, which means, roughly translates as, uh, how do you do, may I please ask that you be kind to me. But even that is not exactly uh, a literal translation of dozo yorushiku. Um, it, it's, it's a uniquely Japanese statement and concept that doesn't communicate directly. So I wonder, and, and I know because Mishima was, again, because he craved the, um, he craved the, the approval of the Western literary establishment, I know that he oversaw the translation. He spoke fluent English, but he still worked with a, uh, an American translator. I, I'm blanking on the name of the woman who translated most of his works. Um, I don't know if she translated this, but... Um, but he worked very closely, making sure that there was a very thorough and very exacting English translation of a lot of his writing. And uh, so with that in mind, I have to think that a lot of that may have been for our benefit, for our edification, because there are things that don't translate literally into uh, English from Japanese. So that may have been it. Um, as we're coming to, uh, we're coming up now on uh, 30 minutes, so uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. And um, uh, let me say, what are your final thoughts on the book, Stefan? And most importantly, would you recommend it to, uh, to our listeners and our readers out there? I would recommend it in general just because I don't think too many of the average readers know about uh, rural uh, 1950s or 19, 1940s Japan. So it's going to be a little... Uh, way of experiencing the world without traveling. If I go to Japan, I'm not going to take a, a, a ferry and go all around the archipelago and, and uh, experience all this. So this is kind of a little little slice of life of that sort of uh, world where these people come from. Um, in regards to the, the language or the style, uh, yeah, you could definitely tell there was translations. Um, the, the spelling is fine, of course, depending on how, who, how it was done. The grammar is a bit off. You, you mix a lot of... Ox- there's not, not a lot of Oxford commas. There's not a lot of uh, line breaks. The, po- the style is not too poetic. It doesn't wax on about uh, the rocks or the fish, but you will get details like all oh, the blood coming out of the gills of a fish and whatnot. So little little moments like that are, are colorized, but uh, it's very brief. It's very uh, quick. Um, it's it's still a slow moving story because again, not much happening. The pacing is very wide and very slow, but that's fine. That's that's the exact feeling you want to get from a story like this. So I would recommend it. Um, it's probably the lightest. Uh, looking at the biography of uh, or bibliography of, of Mishima, this is probably the easiest thing to get into. Um, uh, probably not what I would I would say is a is a definitive Mishima work. But what he was going for and what I think he was trying to do uh, matched. It worked. So I would say it's a it's a successful novella. I agree completely. I would I would wholeheartedly recommend it. I would add uh, to that and developing what you said. I would just add that I think it is a work that is best appreciated in the context of an awareness of a lot of Mishima's other more prominent works. Again, I would recommend Spring Snow, which is the first book in his um, his kind of magnum opus tetralogy, um, the Sea of Fertility. Um, I would recommend Spring Snow as being probably the best introduction or Confessions of a Mask. Uh, either one of those books 
carries the a lot more of the very dark, very sinister themes. Uh, the de- you know you get a lot better impression of the demons that haunted Mishima throughout his life, and ultimately, if if you research his life story, ultimately led to his very, very uh, flamboyant and very public suicide. Um, and so th- those are much, much more disturbing, much more sinister, and much more impactful. But I would totally recommend this book um, for something uh, something very uplifting, something very heartwarming, and certainly something that I think, again, is made much more fascinating by having an already deeper understanding of Mishima and what he was about as a person. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for Book Talk. We will be bringing this back as a regular series. And uh, if you would like to see more of this content, I encourage you to visit patreon.com slash jordanowen42 and consider making a regular donation. You can donate as little as $1 a month. And, or you can support uh, multiple videos if you so desire. Uh, we enjoy bringing you this content. We'd like to do a lot more of it. And uh, Stefan and I will be back in next month with a new installment of Book Talk. So thank you for your time.